obviously WCW gave you a nice offer. Was that when you first got there, was Bischoff still there? Or was that Russo and WCW that gave you the offer? It was both. Okay. Um, it was under the Bischoff Russo regime. Um, the, um, Terry Taylor was the one that reached out first. Um, he was a, a producer agent, whatever yep. might've been part of talent relations. I'm not sure. Uh, but he was the one that reached out and he was the one that sent up the, Hey, you know, we can fly you to Atlanta this week and meet with Eric and, 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 uh, Vince. I'm like, okay. So I met at a hotel suite, um, that I guess Eric and Bish, uh, Bischoff used to, you know, book and write the television at. And after they did that, they had the meeting with me. So I met with both of them. I negotiated the contract with Eric and then briefly discussed potential creative ideas with Russo. So did you like like the landing spot? Were you comfortable in WCW right away? Or were you thinking, oh, man, this is political warfare right off the bat? You know, all those big names are there and there's a lot of turmoil. Obviously, Bischoff and Russo working together was was a bit odd uh, for a lot of different reasons. But what did you think when you first got there? Well, I, I knew what I was getting into. Like I was going there for financial security again, because I had a family and two kids. And to be honest, <clears throat> me as a fan, I always preferred the NWA slash WCW than WWF. I preferred the more pure sports, serious presentation of their product. So in the back of my mind, when I broke into the business, WCW was always my goal more than WWE. And obviously, you know, Jericho had been there. I had friends there, so I knew what I was expecting. So I wasn't going there under the guise of, oh man, I'm going to be a main eventer and, and, and headline here in no time. It's like, I knew where my place was going to be, but <clears throat> I thought there was some degree of void because a lot of the younger talent had left. Yeah. WWE at the time was just saturated with people. So I thought there would be more opportunity to have a place. I knew it would be, you know, the, the top two thirds, but not the top, you know, third. But so I went in there with, this is a good contract. This is going to be financial security and I'll see, you know, as long as I get to have matches, I'll be happy. And then very quickly, it turned out that I'm working with people that I really like and enjoy working with. So it was like, it was fun and rewarding too. Cause it's like, I'm out there having matches with Billy Kidman and Ray Mysterio. And it's like, you know, the MIA guys, it's like, well, this is fun. And obviously, you know, what was it inside of, you know, three or four weeks, it's like, I'm starting to get this big push. So I ended up getting more featured than I expected. So it was like, it was a win-win until I, 10 months later and the place shut down. <laughs> <laughs> right. Unfortunately, but it felt like at the point when you first got there, there was a huge void because that worker, that like work rate guy, the guy that they knew, like the Jericho, uh, the Dean, the Benoit, the Eddie, the Saturn, like that guy that was so synonymous with WCW that like, okay, if Hogan's going to have a, eh, okay, main event against Luger or something like you knew Benoit or somebody in the undercard was really going to make this show worthwhile. So you almost like kind of fit that void to me anyway, the fans like, okay, now they got a work rate guy, a guy who could be either top of the card, middle of the card, whatever, but you knew he was going to have a good match. I always felt like you kind of fit that, that Benoit spot, you know what I mean? Like, okay this is going to be somebody they could do something with. Well, that was sort of the, you know, the void I thought I had a chance of filling and where obviously in WDB, there wasn't a void on any level. They just had, you know, so many people because so many had just recently jumped that direction. So I, I was hoping for that upper middle card spot and, and have that time and that thing to prove my worth and my value. And maybe at some point move up higher than that. But it's like, I was content with that. And I got really lucky in that I started at the exact same time Johnny Ace did. And Johnny Ace came in from all Japan as an agent, really pushing himself as a finish guy that could up the quality of, of matches and, and, and near falls and finishes and stuff. And I had spoke with Johnny back in 94 after Smoky Mountain about potentially going to all Japan um, with Candido. So I had known Johnny a little bit. And we were on the same flight in uh, to the town where I debuted. And so Johnny needed someone who could successfully execute more complicated all Japan style finishes that was willing to be a workhorse and work really hard to demonstrate his value. And obviously I also needed someone on the agent production side 
that saw something in me that would allow me to get the minutes in a match to demonstrate my value. And Johnny saw that in me right away. So he was my agent on my very first segment and for my first, you know, several months there. So he was the prime architect of that initial push. He was the one that called me with, okay, you're going to be winning the U S title tournament. We're giving you a push. We need to establish your finish. We're going to, you know, really get behind you and do something. And he was also the guy that, you know, every day I was at TV, I saw him with fighting to get a few more minutes in those matches, fighting to get me more, more time to highlight me because my success was tied to his success. So it, it really ended up being uh, a good combination. And I benefited greatly from Johnny needing that guy that could do his style of work because there was a lot of guys in WCW that either couldn't or didn't want to work that hard. Right. I don't think that Mike awesome new blood rising you winning the title was his finished. That doesn't have Johnny H written on it, but maybe no, <laughs> that, that was, um, that had disco inferno written all over it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, th I wouldn't have minded the new blood rising finish if we weren't in Canada. Right. And right. it's like, I explained it to them, but they didn't care. But I'm the, just like that crowd liked it. You're not supposed to like it. It's such a bad finish. Yeah. But it's like, it's like, oh, it'll get you so much heat. I'm like, not up here. It won't. Hell no. <laughs> it's nope. like if we were doing it in the States, great. And then the other thing, and I've mentioned this in other interviews that really bothers me in that if the idea was we need to protect Mike Awesome because we have big plans for Mike Awesome, then by all means, sacrifice me and I'll do the five jobs in one match like this ridiculous finish requires. But I think it was two weeks later. It might've been three. Mike awesome got a complete makeover and was that seventies guy. Yes. So it's like doing that to me was a complete waste where if they'd have had their heads about them and knew they were going to make him that seventies guy. I should have just beat him strong, clean in the middle of the ring. And I would have been a God in Vancouver. Yep. And especially with Brett there, like I even. And Jacques Rougeau. Yeah. But do the match. I get the guy in the half crab. He manages to make the break. It's a great false finish. Another couple of false finishes. And finally sharpshooter tap him to the sharpshooter right in the middle of the ring. The place goes absolutely ballistic. I beat him clean. I was presented strong. And then you hit Brett's music. And the place goes absolute batshit crazy. It was one of the loudest things I've ever heard in my life. And you have one of the commentators say, it's like, he used Bret Hart's move. What's Bret Hart going to think about him stealing his move? So you bring Bret out with that question in your mind and he gets in the ring and we stand two feet apart and we look at each other and we hug. And you have Mark Madden hit the line. Well, who do you think taught him the move? He was trained by the Hearts in 1990. He's been a Hart family product since day one. Right, yeah. And you have Bret Hart endorse me and give me his finish. And at that point in time, I'm made for life in Canada. And Mike's being repackaged in three weeks anyway. It's like, so doing that to elevate me would have cost them zero. Yep. Instead, they went with a bunch of Gaga that you know, could have killed me in Canada, to be honest. Right. Like even in the locker room, um, Brett came up to me and he's like, you know, please don't take offense to this, but this crowd could turn on you tonight with that finish. And I said to him, it's like, yeah, I know. I think that's why you're here. And he looked at me, he's like, what do you mean? I said, I think they figured no matter how bad they shit on me tonight, if Bret Hart comes out and raises my hand at the end, they'll forgive me. True. I said, I think you're my get out of jail free card. But he's like, yeah, it could be. He says, but just be aware. He says, like, this crowd could turn on you. And I'm like, I know. And it's like risking that was, in my opinion, idiotic. When Mike's already the fat chick thriller, which is not a you know career defining moment to begin with. No. And then he's going to be wearing you know seventy zoot suits and doing the lava lamp lounge in three weeks. And again, Mike was a good dude and he, he would the first one too. Like he was like, I'd rather just do a clean match and put you over. I'm like, yeah, well, 
that's not what's happening here because uh, Vince Russo and Disco Inferno, Inferno, Disco Inferno are the bookers. It's crazy. You did have a great run despite that that oddly booked pay per view, which is just strange, and especially now knowing that it, it was an ace. And obviously, I figured it wasn't him anyway. But that awesome is going to get repackaged. It's just it was just a, a disaster. But you were booked pretty strong though. I remember you had the three titles at once. The Cruiserweight, the Hardcore, the uh, Saskatchewan Hardcore Invitational title, the shit title, and uh, the U.S. title, which was the Canadian title. I just thought that was awesome because you think, okay, it's legendary U.S. title, sticker, you know, you put it over on the Canadian. I mean, what heat, but I feel like you're booked great in WWE despite some of the craziness that was going on there. Well, that's again, too. Now, again, I don't know this for a 100% fact, but I do believe it to be true, and this is what I was told, that... After I got there, where again, I mentioned that I discussed um, creative with Russo when I first got there, yep. that first meeting, and we're just sitting across the table after Eric and I finished with the contract thing. And he says, you know, just off the top of my head, first idea I have, you're going to be Eric Bischoff's illegitimate son. He <laughs> says, you have that same cocky look on your face that he always has. And I sort of look over at Eric and he looks back at me and part of me is thinking it's like, does him thinking I have a cocky, arrogant look on my face a good thing, or is this going to cause trouble? And then the other thing that went through my head is I look at Eric because he had the black hair at the time, and I'm like, what is he, like 10 years older than me at best? It's like, how is he going to be my dad? Right. And thankfully, the next time I saw them, Eric's like, yeah, I killed that illegitimate kid thing. It's like, that ain't happened. And I'm like, okay, good. But I didn't have a whole lot going on at first. I did the, you know, I ran in, but like they didn't seem to have a direction. And I was told that Vince Russo in a production meeting did the, I don't see anything in him. I don't know what I can do with him. And I was told that Johnny A said, give him to me. He'll be the hottest heel we have in six weeks. And that was the week before the tag team, uh, the U S title tournament when Johnny said, give him to me. So the next, you know, four weeks again it probably took him three and a half weeks he did it <laughs> you know i won that title that title that title i challenged booker t and it's like at that point in time i was if not the hottest heel they had certainly the newest freshest hot heel they had yeah absolutely and, and you know he proved that it could be done and then shortly thereafter he started you know i think they saw the value in johnny and moved him on to other people and then i got the the more ludicrous finishes followed up with that but Again, Johnny was the one, you know, in particular, I know he was, again, he was the guy that worked out the finishes that he wanted for the tournament. He was the one for the, the hardcore and the cruiser. He was the one that really put a lot of pull and fought to get me enough minutes with sting. The time we did sting, Yeah, he was, Great again, man. he primarily put the finish and the ending to the, the Booker T world title match. It's like, that's where he was, um, my biggest advocate. With WCW closing, I know you're part of Team Canada. Mike Awesome eventually becomes a part of Team Canada after uh, Carl Ouellette and had some visa problems. He's gone. Jim Duggan makes a brief appearance. He's gone from Team Canada, which was weird. But Mike Awesome is in Team Canada, and then that kind of leads to the end of WCW. That seemed like it was going to be a pretty strong Team Canada with Mike Awesome. Obviously, the Duggan thing is <laughs> was what was what it was, but it seemed like that was like kind of on the way to being a strong stable with you skipper mike awesome tylen buck yeah they were they were getting behind me and mike as a team now i was of the understanding again i don't know it to be fact but i was of the understanding that he and i were actually going to win the tag team titles on that last nitro oh wow before it became the last nitro that that was the plan but when the wwe people got in it's like well we got to switch the world title because we're not hiring steiner we're taking booker I think the cruiserweight title was changing as well. And they're like, we don't want to change every title. And since they were hiring all four of us, they're like, let's just leave the belts on Palumbo and O'Hare. We'll get through tonight and figure everything out. So Mike and I's WCW tag run got <laughs> cut off at the knees, you know, hours before it was going to happen. Um, which is a shame just that again, I've held tag titles pretty much everywhere I've ever went except WCW would have been a nice yep. you know footnote in history your introduction for me would have had to have been longer yeah there you go yeah but so we missed out on that but yeah mike and i as a team we're, we're going to be you know i think featured fairly strong in the tag team division moving forward 
and even for a very brief run in, in WWE, they were, you know, they were keeping us together, but WWE soured on Mike Awesome sooner than I wish they did, but it, it ended up, you know, I ended up going singles my own way without Mike because they, uh, they kind of fizzled out on Mike pretty quick. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, match videos, or news updates. Support us on Patreon.com for $1.99 a month to watch our full shoot interviews ad-free and help our channel grow. Follow us on Twitter at The Hannibal TV for instant updates.